HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Somewhere out there, there's a man on a park bench eating his 500th PB&J. He has no idea Papa John's has new papadillas that are way better than a boring sandwich. With Papa John's best meats, cheeses, and veggies hand-folded into a crispy flatbread crust. Someone better tell that man. Get a new papadilla in one of four flavors for just six bucks. Better ingredients, better pizza, better than a sandwich. Papa John's. Not valid with discounts, fees, and taxes. Extra prices may vary. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. We are thrilled that this podcast is gaining recognition as a resource for small business owners, entrepreneurs, and sales professionals. From MSNBC's Your Business to Inc.com to Fit Small Business, Proven, a whole host of other sites, Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is enjoying inclusion on lists of the best podcasts to listen to. I attribute this uh, in uh, large measure to the guests that I have had the opportunity to speak with over the years. Today is no different. My guest today is Jeremy Ring. Jeremy has enjoyed success in both public and private arenas. After graduating from Syracuse University, he eventually landed in what proved to be a life-changing role with a recently launched Yahoo. For the next five years, he would be part of history, business history with a 50-yard line seat. He saw the good and the bad decisions, the missteps and the triumphs. It was a business and life education of the highest order, and he learned much from the experience. Since leaving Yahoo, Jeremy has been a successful entrepreneur, a Florida state senator, and he is currently running for the office of the CFO of the state of Florida. He's also been a champion for students with his Students Unite with Parents and Educators to Resolve Bullying, otherwise known as Superb. Thanks so much for joining me today, Jeremy. Oh, thank you, Dane. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I, I'm really honored to have you with us. It's um, always so interesting 
uh, to talk to someone who's been on the inside of major transformation and, and Yahoo was one of those places. Would you share with us uh, your experience at Yahoo? Uh, well, I mean, when you're growing, when you're part of an early startup that shoots to the moon, you're, you have too many experiences to obviously put in a single answer. But, uh, uh, you know, my, initially I was, uh, 25 years old, I, I think, and may have been 24. And I started uh, the kind of East Coast office for Yahoo out of my apartment in New York. And I was the first salesperson hired uh, worldwide outside of our um, senior vice president of sales. I was his first hire. Uh, prior to that, um, I was at an advertising agency and uh, MCI Communications, who uh, was my client. And I was part of the team that helped put the first advertising ever up on Yahoo and help them develop their initial uh, advertising program. So kind of was with them, not as a founder by any stretch, but certainly ground floor. Wow. That's crazy. And when you started there, did you have any idea that it was going to skyrocket the way that it did? You know, it's funny. I No, I mean, I didn't have a ch- I didn't know it would skyrocket the way. I didn't know we'd be a company that within five years would have a market capitalization of $120 billion, as much as at the time Disney, News Corp, and Viacom combined. Um, but did I know it was special? Yeah. that I definitely knew something special was happening when I started. Um, I, I, that didn't, I guess the scope surprised me, yeah. but, uh, but, but it, it was before I started, even though there were only a few people there from the minute, they incorporated and launched it was something special. That's interesting. What can, can you uh, put your finger on? What was it about the the company that was special? Like what what stood out for you that let you know this was different? You know, and <laughs> I don't know what I would call it back in 1995, and in today's 2017 world, I call it the Uber test meaning does your Uber driver uh, uh, talk to you about it? And whatever that Uber test was back in 1995, you know, it became quickly a large brand that, you know, wherever wherever you went, it was part of a, a water cooler discussion, whether I was in New York or I remember going to Costa Rica and, and people talking about it, um, wherever I was in the world, actually. So that kind of water cooler passing the Uber driver test. That's great. I love that. That that is great. I totally get it. So, why do you think it failed? You know, what what happened that caused it to have such trouble? Well, you know, it's a long answer. I've been trying to come up with an elevator speech to make that <laughs> simple, and and I haven't been able to. It's hard, but I think the best way I could uh, explain it was. It was a lot of individuals, because we were the first company that came out, I think, of kind of an old line publishing world, where the rules of publishing were fairly straightforward. For example, advertising and editorial don't mix. On the internet, you could create your own rules. Google created their own rules. They created a paid search program called AdWords, which became a $75 billion a year business. To them, kind of an open whiteboard to what the rules should be. Uh, whereas Yahoo said, we won't do a paid search program because to us that compromises the adver- advertising editorial um, kind of wall that traditional advertisers and traditional media had always, you know, lived by. I think that was part of it, not, you know, kind of, it needed to be more than just a magazine or a newspaper on a computer screen. It needed to create its own roles. I'm not sure Yahoo recognized that one, they could create their own rules. Um, and then second, uh, the, not, this was not the first team. The second team that came in after after our team kind of moved on uh, was very risk adverse. And to be risk adverse in any technology company, let alone an internet company, is an entire kiss of death. Yeah. Um, and so by the time, for example, Marissa Mir started in 2012, Yahoo had already lost in search social, commerce, video, 
advertising, and honestly, I'm not sure there's many more, you know, um, areas of the internet. And if you lose in all those, you're not going to succeed. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. I I find that um, for a lot of businesses, especially with the way the world has changed so dramatically in the past 20 years, if if you try and stick to old ways of doing things and you can't be curious and see beyond and what's possible and be willing to try things, uh, you know, not only can the business world pass you by, but then you have these other companies come up that just race past you. You could be the first, but if you're not really sure. constantly moving forward, right? I mean, is that yeah? I have a term for that. I have a term for that. I call it getting Netscaped. If you recall, <laughs> Netscape had ninety plus percent of the desktop browser, and yeah. quickly they were put put to shame. Um, yeah, the, the answer is, uh, you know, being first isn't always the answer. I mean, Facebook was by no means the first social network. Google was by no means the first uh, search engine. YouTube was by no means the first, you know, video driven uh, yeah. a, a website. So, you know, being first is not always, I mean, history tells us that it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean you're going to succeed. Um, yeah. uh, you want to be early but you don't necessarily have to be, have to be first. And, you know, but, you know, one of the things, and I'm, we're seeing it today in this whole cryptocurrency world, for example, I don't know where it's going to go. I mean, I have my thoughts, but, but nevertheless, um, it's hysterical to me to listen to kind of all the old line investors um, running away and say, you know, you know, calling out fire, don't go anywhere near it, burning buildings, right. stay away. Um, and, and I'm not here to make any predictions on what's going to be successful and what's not. But it sure sounds to me that something in the cryptocurrency world would be successful. And I, I usually believe, for me, if I have once an old line kind of person, an old line, like in this case, financial institution, screams to run away, I think that's the best time to run in. And, and I think that's the same thing that happened, you know, in the Internet. The people that yeah. ran away, the smart ones were the ones that, that ran in, the people that we've seen that in history throughout. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. So why would you say Facebook succeeded? I mean, it sounds to me like part of it is that they were willing to adapt to what the consumer wanted. Is is that, you know, well, I think I think well, people don't understand about. I mean, let's call them dot com companies because that's really still what they are. Lighting the fuse takes a lot of luck. Growing it takes a lot of smarts. <laughs> okay, again, Facebook. Why did they take off? I mean, it was it was luck, right time, right place. They were in colleges, and a bunch of kids from Harvard saw a social network and started using it. Do I think that was a lot of smart, great marketing skill? No, no, I don't. I think there's a lot of luck involved. But then what did they do? When did smarts come about? Fairly quickly. Because once they had a user base, they quickly recognized two, two things. A, what the consumer was wanting and demanding. And they gave the consumer that. Um, really, three things. The second thing they did is... When they saw potential competition, they acquired it, i.e. Instagram and WhatsApp, and they, they took big risks. I mean, they acquired WhatsApp for $19 billion, and they were doing no revenue. That's a big risk to take, and they took it, so I give them that. And the third thing is you know, to give the advertisers what they want. Someone still has to pay the bills. Right. And, and you know, if, I, I believe Facebook created an ad platform where the marketers – are just as happy as, as the consumers. You add it all together and you obviously have this addictive, you know, um, addictive environment that they've created. Um, and, 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 you know, they're more than off and running. They're controlling our world. They've changed the world. They've connected the world like no other organization in, in history. Um, so I think, you know, I go back, I think luck, luck lights the fuse and, you know, skill, skill grows it. That's terrific. 
And what a great lesson for the entrepreneurs out there and the small business owners who, uh, you know, get started with something. And it's so important to pay attention to what is your uh, client base, what is what is your t- market telling you they need and want, and can you continue to provide it, that you have to be able to be um, a little bit flexible because times change, things change, and, and the needs of the consumer or the marketplace continue to change. Yeah, and in this case, you have two very distinct audiences, Facebook and Google, for example. They have a business audience and a consumer audience, yeah. and they have to figure out how to, you know, uh, take care of, of, of both sides, both stakeholders equally without leveraging one to compromise the other. And um, that's a trick. I mean, if you're any yeah. great business, right, let's think about this for a minute. If you're a great business, let's, let's look at some of the great businesses that may be out there uh, online, whether it's Google or Facebook and, you know, in the retail world, you can look at a company like Home Depot, Costco, and you have three stakeholders, right? Your customers, your employees, and your shareholders. Right. And if you can take care of all three legs of that stool equally, you're going to be a great company. Um, if you if you forget about one and leave one behind, you're going to get in trouble somewhere along the way. Yeah. And you know, I think I think that happened to Yahoo. Um, you know, because it's really we're talking about Yahoo. I think Yahoo left the customers behind. I mean, the users. Uh-huh. And once they left the users behind. Um, then the shareholders followed and, and obviously the advertisers followed. Right. And if you don't give all three legs of that stool, all three stakeholders equal love and equal attention, it will collapse that stool. Yep. Yep. And that's, and that's a great example of how that happens. So do you have a sense of where you think all of this technology is going? Like what the future holds for, all of us? I don't. I don't think anybody does. And I'll tell you why. Um, I, I use this analogy all the time. It's not about technology. It's about adoption. What do I mean by that? I'm 47 years old today. Ever since I was born, I remember people saying the world would be all solar power and electric cars. I'm still waiting. <laughs> and it's not as if it's not as if the technology is not there to do it. Yeah. The adoption is not there to do it. So we can talk about you know, augmented reality, we can talk about internet of things, we can talk about driverless cars and drones, and, you know, we can, t- we can talk about cryptocurrencies, we, we, we can, we can discuss all, all of that, we can talk about robotics, but at the end of the day, it comes down to adoption, technology will be there, will adoption actually follow, and in some cases it will, and others it won't, it's probably more likely that it'll follow, for example, in uh, something like augmented reality than it will in driverless cars. To me, driverless cars is not about technology. It's about, is it going to be another electric car, which is, it's a great, of the 1970s, where, you know, it was there, the technology was there, there was just no adoption. Um, And so I don't know the answer to to the question. I know it's out there, but what we tend to forget in society is, uh, is it so much psychological more than it is technological engineers can build almost anything but they can't build the human brain and and where the human brain may go now it's it's happening it's ironic no one a year ago really mainstream heard of cryptocurrency and it's come out of nowhere to become again it's passing the uber test today the uber driver test so so i don't know the answer to the question i just i just do know that that technology sometimes there's a great gap between technology and adoption. It is interesting because there it's it, it's I think it's been well for me it's been fascinating over the past couple of years to see the kinds of things that have just taken off and it's definitely something that's meeting a need in the environment but like you know Uber for example we've had taxis forever but all of a sudden, being able to get on your phone and order a car and watch the car come to where you are, it, it, it's bizarre, but it works. Well, it also worked because 
let's be honest, taxis are gross and Uber cars are cleaner. Yeah. Um, I mean, the reality is, is, you know, I don't, you, 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 and, and, and I will say that, you know, having been a state senator, and I know we're not here to talk about politics, I, I was part of a lot of those um, debates between, you know, the uh, Ubers and Lyfts of the world and the taxi companies. And the taxi companies would, you know, try to use their legacy to, you know, uh, kind of get government to, to try to, you know, stop the Ubers of the world. But what they didn't do is try to make their cars cleaner. What they didn't do was try to make um, the experience better, uh, uh, you know, for their customers or et cetera. All they did was try to fight it legislatively. And they lost that fight because they weren't focused on making a better experience. Definitely. That's, that, that is awesome. That is exactly it. And that's what these you know, business owners and leaders and managers and whatever, you know, I think that that is one of the most important things that they need to realize that you always have to be paying attention to that. And as you said, it's not just the user, it's the employees, it's the stakeholders, it's what uh, is everybody getting what they need and want out of it. And I think oftentimes that starts with the user experience. Well, but I think this is something that we forget a lot. How big of a leap is the behavioral change? People were still used to getting in taxis. I can make a case, and someone can argue the other side, that getting in an Uber is not a great behavioral change necessarily, because we're used to getting into a taxi and have someone drive us. I can make a good case, though, that a driverless car is a large behavioral change. (laughs) And so... We forget that, again, it's not just about technology. It's about adoption. It's about behavioral changes. I'm a big believer that any technology company that's out there should have an entire team of social scientists and psychologists, you know, on staff. Because if you're going to make too big of a leap of a behavioral change, your chances of succeeding are a lot less than if it's just a simple evolution. I mean, the iPhone was an evolution of the World Wide Web was an evolution of the internet. The iPhone was an evolution of the World Wide Web. Um, augmented reality could be an evolution of the iPhone. Then I can see the steps and it makes sense to me. If we're asking users or consumers to make a real true behavioral change in their lives, that's again, that's the 1970s argument of we're going to have solar power and electric cars and we're still waiting. Yep. Yeah, boy, that is a great point. Yeah, human nature is such that change is slow. Massive change is is, uh, very, really very difficult. Wow, that's such a great point. I have to take a quick sponsor break, and then I have some more questions for you. Okay. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. If you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are 8020 Sales and Marketing by Perry Marshall and The Go-Giver by Bob Berg. So visit audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're talking with Jeremy Ring about, really about how success happens in today's world, and um, on the flip side of that is uh, how it doesn't really happen. So we, you, you mentioned a, a couple minutes ago about the taxi business and them trying to legislate their way into remaining uh, relevant. Um, is there a role for government to play in entrepreneurship, do you think? And if so, Absolutely. Absolutely, but probably not where people think. Oh, okay. You know, so... You know, entrepreneurs aren't interested in tax cuts, okay? They're not interested in lots and lots of incentives necessarily. Those are more for larger companies. 
they're interested in, in creating, you know, different incubators and different environments and building up higher education. They're, they're interested, you know, if government, you know, controls its public universities, um, and I'm really on the technology side now, um, that should be very important to, you know, entrepreneurs to be able to have environments where their, where their, you know, IP can be um, uh, prepared, uh, where incubators can help create, you know, help them with the, the challenges of starting a business, whether it's legal, accounting, different governances issues, whether uh, incubators can help with proof of sales um, or, or executive recruitment or whatever it may be to kind of package a company up. And I'm a big believer that government through its university system should really be driving technology incubators. And I think that's a great way to help, uh, to help drive uh, entrepreneurship. And, and just, you know, there, there's three ways that, um, that you build an economy. Uh, the first way is, uh, if you're a, a state, for example, like Florida, where I am, the first way is you give big companies lots of incentives and try to get them to move. And we did that in Florida with JetBlue and Hertz. The second way is you take our existing businesses and, and you grow them. That's the blocking and tacking, tackling every day the legislature does, whether it's property tax, property insurance, those sorts of issues. But the third way is ground up and it's entrepreneurship. And that really starts through higher education. And a lot of that higher education is our public universities, which are, are funded, funded at the sta state level by government. I think that's where they can really be active. Do you think they get entrepreneurship? Like, do they I understand think there is a, how it motors? I think there's no. I, first of all, I think there's a massive gap today between our universities and our workforce needs. But I think, you know, you have to understand legislators, unless, you know, they come to the, to the role based on what their experiences are. For example, if you have a legislator who's been a home builder, they're gonna lead on home building issues. It's where they're gonna kind of drive to. If you have one that's a trial attorney, they're gonna work on tort issues. If you've had someone that's been built a technology company or has led a company with a large technology aspect to it, then they're gonna lead more on the technology front. You know, so really it comes down to legislators, just they just tend to follow where their life experiences have been more than anything. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So speaking of higher education, what advice would you give to a college student today? Like where should they be focusing their energy, do you think? Okay, I have changed my mind on this over the years. Okay. I, re I really have. If you asked me this question a year ago, I probably would have had a different answer than I have today. I think a college student honestly should leave college, graduate college, and I think they should go work for a really big company in a really big city. Because I think they get experience, but they're put in an environment where they can meet a lot of people. Um, and that building that network is invaluable for for the rest of your life, you know, and, and a lot of, it's easy. I was like this, you know, it's easy to get uh, impatient when you're 21 years old and, you know, you're at the low rung of the pole and you don't feel like you're doing anything of value. And I tell those 21 year old kids, if you're at a big company, that company is using you, but you should use them. And you're 21 years old. Don't worry about being loyal to, to this large company. Use them, learn as much as you can, meet as many people as you can, go to as many networking events as you can and move on that every job that you get should be focused not on your first job. And, you, and I say this about people, recent college grads, I would have a different answer for someone older, but your first job should really be in your mind, I am taking this job to get to my second job. What is your second job gonna be? Is it gonna be working for another large company? Is it gonna be going and starting your own business? And being an entrepreneur? But 99.9% .9 of these college students are not ready to go start their own business. They're just right. not. You know, the the, the 99999999 percent, <laughs> they're not ready. And and yeah. I think you have to put yourself in a position to get experience, use the company that you're 
you're, you're working at. Go to a big city, network the heck out of as much as you can, go to every networking event, and take your first job to focus on what your second job is going to be. I love that. Partly because I have a 21-year-old who's going to be graduating from college soon. Uh, and that, that makes perfect sense for me. It's, it's so different now uh, that, like it was when I graduated from college. I think it's even different from maybe 10 years ago. Uh, what, what that, and does it matter what you do at that large company? I, I mean... It matters the exposure you have. Okay. It matter it matters the networking that you can do. Um, okay. That's what matters um, more than anything. Your you, what what holds you for your life is the relationships that you get. Yeah. You know, obviously, if if whatever your responsibilities are, you're not fulfilling them, you'll be fired and deservingly right. so. So fulfill all your responsibilities, learn as much as you can, but build that network. And, uh, you know, I, I would tell my, my own kids, and my oldest is 16, about to be 17, when he graduates college, he should, I mean, if he's going to stay in Florida, be in Miami. If he doesn't want to stay in Florida, go to New York, San Francisco, Chicago, or Dallas, or Boston. Go somewhere where you can build those life relationships and get that kind of exposure. Had I not been in New York, I would not have been um, uh, exposed to Yahoo. Right. Right. Well, I completely agree with that. I, I think relationships are that that is what business is all about. And, and that's how you get where you want to be. And you are given opportunities that you wouldn't necessarily have otherwise. I, I am all about that. I, I completely agree with that. So thanks. Mm -hmm. So, but if we, all right, so let's sort of flip it. If we have someone who is not a college student or a recent graduate and they are listening and they're thinking that they have a, you know, tech idea, consumer tech idea. Um, how do you think they should go about building it in today's environment? I think about building it. Um, you know, I, <laughs> how do you, how do you build something? Well, you know, what do you have behind you? Do you have capital? Do you have resources? Do you have great engineering talent? Um, do you think you can hit that spark? Do you have marketing talent um, behind you? An idea alone is not going to, is not enough to get you anywhere. Yeah. You, you have to have the, 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 the wherewithal to put that idea into something commercially viable. And I see a lot of people that come to me with ideas and they're fine. They're great, but they don't, they don't have any uh, go to market understanding. I'm not even sure they, they understand how to build the product that they have an idea on. Um, so if you're going to succeed as an entrepreneur in the tech space, you, know, you need to come with, more than an idea. How are you going to build that and how are you going to market it and how are you going to fund it? And for those three questions, really, how are you going to fund it first, then how are you going to build it, then how are you going to market it? If you can answer those three questions and confidently answer those three questions, then you probably you know, need to move on. If yeah. you think you can confidently answer those three questions, then take a shot at it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great, because I think people run in with, you know, I have this great idea and someone's going to give me the money for it or uh, I'll worry about that late. You know, I'll worry about the marketing so, of it later. And, right. So one of my one of my rules of thumb is when someone walks up to me and says, I have two rules of thumb. Number one is when someone walks up to me and says, if I got a deal for you, that means run the other way. <laughs> and then the other thing is when somebody, you know, um, doesn't have a lot of resources or money comes to you and says, Hey, my friend wants me to invest in their company. What should I do? Run the other way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, those, those are kind of two, <laughs> and two examples of when I, when I would run the other way, but especially the, have I got a deal for you person? Absolutely. And when you talked before about um, government and education and all that, I know around here, a lot of the, colleges, uh, whether they're community colleges or, or four-year, are setting up those sorts of 
um, like R and D uh, sex. Um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Like programs where you don't have to be a student there. You have, just have to be somebody in the community. And if you have an idea, you can go and make an appointment and sit down and go over it with engineers and uh, retired business people and all kinds of things so that you can really flesh it out before you invest any money in it or ask anybody or, you know, any of those kinds of things. So I'm hoping more and more of that becomes available for people who think they have an idea. Yeah, I think it's great. Again, you 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 need more than an idea, but if you have if you have access to 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 you know strong engineers, if you have access to experienced successful business executives, um, if you have access to a team that can guide and mentor you and coach you, um, well, you need that. I I mean, at the end of the day, that's that that's an absolute requirement it's not a nice to have it's a need to have yeah yeah definitely okay so i sort of want to um turn a little bit um away from uh consumer and and ask you a question you know because of your experience in in this realm of huge you know massive uh technology companies what would you say in today's environment are the greatest threats in the world and how can technology help us with that and how do you think it hurts us with that? I mean, technology only helps and it only hurts. You know, whether you're talking about um, cybersecurity. Yeah. You know whether you're whether you're talking about nuclear nuclear proliferation, whether you're talking about something as dangerous as a tweet. You know it 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 help whether you're talking about you know finding a new form of you know Alcoholics Anonymous called Facebook Anonymous or Twitter Anonymous, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, 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 but but at the same time. Um, we got to remember something. This information age world that we're in um, came about so quickly. Yeah. Over that society wasn't prepared. Society's still playing catch up um, to, to to that. Our brains are still playing catch up to uh, still trying to catch up to to how fast the information age blew in and, and obviously, you know, started as a, you know, a raindrop and became a category 50, you know, um, yeah. massive megastorm that never left us kind of like you know, Jupiter's red spot or whatever it may be. So, um, yeah. um, that, uh, that the truth is that, um, we haven't we haven't caught up we as a society don't under we don't we take it for granted without putting depth into the understanding of what it's doing to us both negatively and how positively it can um it can help us but you know it how do for example we'll get to a point within the near future where there probably won't be a whole lot of people working in mcdonald's anymore Right. right. It'll be right. robotic. You're not going to have checkout people necessarily at Target and Walmart. So all these jobs are going to go yeah. and we can fight it, but it's, we're going to be fighting a, a, a fight that we're not going to win. So what do we do to get in front of that? Right. You know, what, what do we do to retrain people? What do, what do we do to put people in positions where, you know, those jobs that they had aren't going to be here, but they can succeed in, and something else. Um, how are we going to How are we going to create a world where the jobs of today don't exist yeah. tomorrow? Not to sound cliche. And if we don't get in front of that, we'll, you know, um, and we know it's coming. But if if we can't get in front of it, you know, it's going to have a massive negative effect on society, and it's going to cause 
challenges for for the whole world. Right. Um, yeah. Are we thinking Are we thinking about that? Well, you hear it mentioned every so often. You see the occasional article in the New York Times about it, but it's not something that's mainstream thought. It's certainly not something government spends a whole lot of effort on. Uh, they don't. Um, and uh, you know, it's it, we know we know this 500 foot tidal wave is about to hit us. We know it's out there in the ocean somewhere, and we're doing absolutely nothing to prepare for it. Yeah. Right. That that's right. And so we're not going to be able to get out of the way. Do it. something about it. I mean, is it business leaders who are going to have to do something about it? Is it a combination of private public? It, is it? It's definitely. Well, I think it's definitely public. You know, a, a business leader is going to say, "How can I?" you know, create the greatest profits with the less, least amount of right. employees. Right. And that, and that, you know, they're, they have a responsibility to their shareholders. So I don't think they're going to be at the cutting edge of this. Um, yeah. They'll be at the cutting edge of the technology. I don't think they'll be at the cutting edge of replacing the jobs. Right. Um, so I do think it's clearly up to government to, to do that. Um, and I say this in the most bipartisan way. This is not a partisan statement at all. You know, certainly government has demonstrated it's not up to the task. Right. Um, you know, by any means to, 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 you know, yep. attempt to, to fix these, in, you know, incoming problems. Right. Right. That's scary. Mm -hmm. So, is there yeah, anything that 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 people can do about this? Yeah, right retrain yourself. Yeah. Retrain yourself. I mean, yeah. you get go back, go back and get a trade, get a technology degree. I mean, do something that um, gets you ready for uh, uh, you know a, a world that we think has changed, but isn't you know hasn't changed to the extent that um, it's going to. Um, you know, in nineteen in the year. You know, in, in the year 1995, uh, if we look at the video game uh, analogy, you know, the internet was in its pong phase. Yeah. You know, it spent the 2000s in, in its Atari phase. Yeah. You know, it's kind of still coming out of the Atari phase. It's maybe in the early Nintendo, you know, phase, but it, it's not up to the, you know, today's Xbox phase and right. what's coming. And, um, and so, so we got a long way to go. And uh, no, I don't think I don't think we're prepared. I don't think, again, other than the occasional newspaper article or magazine article warning about impending doom, yeah, uh, you don't see action on it. No, right. That's right. People talk about it. They just don't know what to do about it. Correct. Wow, that sounds like opportunity to me. Everything. I mean, who who yeah. was it that said? Uh, was it Rahm Emanuel said a, you know, a crisis is a horrible thing to waste or something? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't remember the exact quote, but yeah. Obviously, you know, opportunity exists at crisis points, or it exists when you see impending crisis. Um, you know, if you're smart enough to get in front of it, you'll succeed. Yep. Yep. You know, at it, if you you can easily be washed away though. Right. Exactly. Sure. It, yeah, it's, it's a tricky it's a tricky time. I, I think the next um, several years are going to be really interesting to see how how all of this plays out. Exactly. Yeah. So I want. Last night I was having dinner with my brother and sister in law, and we got into this conversation about technology and the internet and and how kids as young as two years old can unlock their parents' phones and go on and what do you do? Uh, like my brother-in-law was, was really worried about what is happening to people and kids and, and are they going to be encountering things that they shouldn't be and how do you keep them safe and, and all of those things. And, and what what are your thoughts on you know how connected we are, and privacy and safety, and all of those sorts of things. Well, I'm a parent of four young kids, so I, I deal with this. Um, you're not 
you're not going to hold technology back. It's hysterical when I think of when I think of parents thinking they can actually hold back technology. You, you can't. Um, and and what are you going to do? You're going to are you going to tell your kids they can't have an iPhone, and that, that or an an iPad? That's, yeah, not, right. that's not reasonable either. Can you you know you can put all the you can put certain parent uh, triggers. That's you know what do you I mean? I, I don't think they, that that's going to work all too well either. Um, you know, I, I think you just have to do your best job that you can do to you know. Tell your teach your kids what's appropriate and, and and not appropriate at young ages, you know. But I mean, you know, I guess on one hand, it's forcing us to uh, to to better prepare our our kids more than our parents had to prepare us, you know. But on the other hand, is there a let kids be kids type of mentality that maybe we overreact? Maybe yeah. kids are smarter than we think. Maybe that they already know how to find information better than we do. So what are we going to do? I mean, if they're smarter than we are, are we really, you know, going to be able to hold a candle to them? Right. And, you know, I mean, a lot of kids, I can think of myself and all my neighborhood friends, you know, we did what I would consider today pretty stupid things. And, you know, we all, we all did pretty well. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, sometimes I think that we need to over prepare our kids. And sometimes I, I think that we just think too much about this. I'm with you completely. Thank you for that. I, I am totally with you. I, I listen to those conversations and I think, okay, well, this is a train. It's rolling down the track. You're not going to stop it. So embrace it. Figure out how to let it work for you and work for your family. So, and I mean, my kids. Let me give you an example. Let me give you my, my sure. 16 is almost 17. You know, he's a he, he's got that screen at screen addiction. Yeah. So, you know, I could have fought it and I tried to fight it and I fought a losing fight. So I finally said, Okay, then you have no choice. You're gonna take coding classes. You know, you're gonna start learning to program, you're gonna learn Python, you're gonna learn C plus plus. Um, and he has. So if this is where your world if this is where your mind is, then you know, don't just play the games, learn how to create the games. Seems yeah. to have worked for him. Yeah, that's great. That is great. It's really leaning into it, right? It's saying you can fight them or you can join them, and fighting them is not going to get you where you're hoping to go. So. But, but we also, you know, we're so, as, as parents, we're so narcissistic. I mean, we say this is a kid's issue. My gosh, how many adults do you see all day long with their sure. face and their phone? I know I do that a lot of times. I mean, this is not just a kid's issue, by no. any, it's a society issue. And we can't control ourselves. <laughs> We're, you know, talking about having to control our kids. Yeah. Yeah. And we got, we got to learn to look in the mirror just a little bit, too. Yep. Absolutely. We do not set an example. I mean, how many parents tell their kids to get off their phones while they're sitting on the screens themselves? <laughs> all of them. All of us. Every yeah. one of us. Yeah. Nonstop. Right. Every right. single one of them. Yep pretty universal yeah. so we're yeah. not exactly setting great examples no we aren't which you know, is so typical right do as i say not as i do yeah i mean that's that, that's what it is i mean this is yeah. you know we, we should set better examples we shouldn't be on our yeah. our screens you know ad nauseum either yep absolutely right set the example well, this is so yeah. great. I have to tell you how much I, I appreciate you sharing all of this information. I think it's so, it's so refreshing and such a great viewpoint to be able to talk to somebody who was in the thick of things and got to see it firsthand. And, and as you, know, you say in your bio, a 50-yard line view. And from there to where we are today, uh, those um, lessons and the viewpoint and the ideas are really, really valuable, I think, for any business, uh, whether it's technology or not, and, and any small business that wants to continue to be relevant and vibrant and thrive in today's world, we have to remember these things. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Can I plug the book? Absolutely. Please do. Tell my listeners 
everything that they need to know. Okay, so on January 23rd, um, the book from Post Hill Press and the Salesforce of Simon & Schuster, Post Hill was a spin-off division of, of, or, of Simon & Schuster, um, releasing the book, uh, or I think they're separate from Simon & Schuster now, um, releasing the book called We Were Yahoo. We Were Yahoo can be pre-ordered uh, today on Amazon. You go to weweryahoobook.com or just go to Amazon and type in We Were Yahoo. Its story is about the rise and fall of Yahoo, but how the fall of Yahoo created Google and Facebook. Um, it's got anecdotes in there of what I call the biggest mistakes in the history of business, part one through seven, because Yahoo had a lot of big mistakes. Um, they could have bought Google for $1 million and, and didn't, and they could have bought Facebook for a billion dollars and didn't. Both companies have a market cap of over a trillion dollars today, so you can throw around the word trillion um, and talk about missed opportunities. So uh, to me, it, it's a story that should be told. It's kind of like the, you know, the time that Bill Gates and Paul Allen stole the uh, operating system from Microsoft or Steve Jobs stole the uh, 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 graphical user interface from Xerox. It should be a kind of that sort of mainstream story that, that that's told out there um, because there were some, there were some big, big lapses in judgment, big mistakes um, made. And uh, this book kind of goes through them on detail from the beginning of the company all the way till its end as a uh, private independent, as an independent company when Verizon um, finalized their acquisition of them earlier this year. Wow, it sounds great. That mm -hmm. sounds really terrific. Thank you so much. And I always like to thank the listeners uh, you folks are who we're doing this for and get out and pre-order the book because the, the just the history alone uh, I think would be really interesting and valuable but the lessons I uh, will be invaluable for you as you um, continue on your journeys also like to thank our sponsor get a free trial and a free audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash business growth continue to prosper and be curious and until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Somewhere out there, there's a man on a park bench eating his 500th PB&J. He has no idea Papa John's has new papadillas that are way better than a boring sandwich. With Papa John's best meats, cheeses, and veggies hand-folded into a crispy flatbread crust. Someone better tell that man. Get a new Papa D in one of four flavors for just six bucks. Better ingredients, better pizza, better than a sandwich. Papa John's. Not valid with discounts, fees, and taxes. Extra prices may vary. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Oh, that's a cheer we used to do in softball. Uh, what? It's, uh, actually Geico's. Whenever someone hit a triple, we would wave our bats and yell, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. But we never got to use it because we would only hit home runs. Annoying. The phrase is from Geico because they help save people money. Geico? Yeah, they were our team sponsor. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Great careers are forged out of great relationships. Your success, whatever your field, relies and thrives on the support and insights of others. I'm Andy Lapata, an author and speaker on the power of professional relationships. In the Connected Leadership podcast, I have the privilege of interviewing people from around the world to understand the relationships that have made a difference on their journey and how their insights can help you. From Nobel Prize winners to Olympians, from NASA astronauts to peace campaigners, my guests have shared some captivating moments from their lives and careers. Combined with experts from leading universities, cutting-edge authors and giants of business, the Connected Leadership Podcast aims to inspire, educate and entertain. 